This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining me today. With us is Richard Fields and John Cameron. Gentlemen, there's something that is happening today or this week that is going to uh, make at least libertarians happy. It looks like they're going to repeal the War Powers Act or the War Power Authorization for Iraq like 15, 20 years too late or whatever it is now. What do you guys think about that? Authorization for the use of force, uh, which was originally uh, put in place shortly after 9-11, which was 2001, which is 20 years ago. Uh, Saddam Hussein bit the dust, hung by his neck by his uh, fellow countrymen in Iraq uh, 15 years ago, 15 years without the excuse of going to war with Iraq, which was a faulty excuse in the first place for going to war. And finally, they're getting rid of the AUM. It's about time. I, yeah, uh, past, past due, but like any other, like any other government uh, uh, program, um, you know, they, they create them with a stroke of a pen uh, and, and uh, unintended consequences are, are usually much worse than than the intended consequence or the the whatever the problem they were trying to fix probably wasn't a problem to start with and then somebody's got way more power and lots of money gets spent and it never goes away and this one's especially egregious because um, you know it uh, the whole Iraq war and then its continuation into the war on or Iraq and the war on terror and all the rest of that has cost. Uh, about as much money that as uh, Biden's planning on printing this year. So it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money and a lot of lives. Um, we, well, yeah, and, and, and over generations, people who are now in Afghanistan, fighting in Afghanistan, supposedly going to be withdrawn soon, who knows, weren't born uh, yeah. when, when this uh, so-called war on terror began. Yeah, well, it's, and some of them actually... Uh, I think, are the progeny of people who fought in it. But, you know, typically the, the soldier now is a little bit older, um, but but you're right. Uh, and, and not only, you know, in and of itself, us, the, the U.S. sticking its nose in places and trying to, you know, fix things and pick winners and losers and fights and fight terror and everything, is, is is a bad thing. But the un, some of the unintended consequences is people actually uh, – you know, like uh, um, interpreters, people who worked in, you know, commissaries, people who supported troops, the civilian populace in in these countries, in Afghanistan, and um, especially Afghanistan, um, a lot of them are just going to get wiped out because we're not going to let them come, you know, to the states where they're relatively safe, <clears throat> you know, uh, relatively. But, uh, you know, that's a religious war. And, and they were fighting on the side of the devil. So, you know, a lot of them are going to be summarily executed after we leave. So, you know, not only have we caused a lot of loss of life uh, while we were there, but we're going to cause more when we leave. Yeah. And, and you talk about unintended consequences, but we need to remember that the unstated but intended consequence of uh, most of these wars is to keep the war machine alive, to keep the defense contractors in, in high clover, to make sure that the military industrial complex is alive and thriving. And my mm. gosh, it has been for the last for the last uh, two decades. Mm. Well, and even longer, didn't, uh, was it Eisenhower that then he was a general, commanding general of, I think all U.S. forces at one time, he warned against the industrial complex the military industrial complex in 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 the 50s um, yeah 1956 and, is a yeah. farewell address yeah and i mean it got bad with vietnam but vietnam pales in comparison to the yeah. expenditures on arms and military hardware and ammunition etc that we yeah. spent in the so-called war on terror yeah and then there's 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 another unintended consequence it's not really an unintended consequence it's a Nobody will admit that it's the case, but um, you know, m my theory is that one of the goals of the U.S. military establishment is to always have blooded troops. You know, blooded troops are troops, troops in leadership, non-commissioned officers, officers, and troops that have been in combat. 
Um, and, you know, with the idea that if you ever to go to combat again, people who've actually shot at someone and been shot at, um, typically modern ba battles happen so quickly and turn so quickly that they having blooded troops, my theory, and, you know, I've got a lot of crazy theories, is that, that they always want to make sure they have blooded troops. So when they go to war, they have a much greater chance of winning. Because this war is, you know, people practice the heck out of war and they do war games and all the rest of that. But the reality of war is so much different than the than training for war that um, only, you know, the only way you can do it, I mean, it sounds callous and cruel, and it, and it is, is to have people get shot every once in a while. And nobody talks about that, except for maybe me. So maybe I shouldn't talk about it. I don't know. Well, you talk about that with your parachute pulls sitting there right over next to your, over your, what, your right, left shoulder. No, I, I get turned around. Yeah. Yeah. But that, 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 that's a, that's kind of a funny story. Cause I pulled that on the ground. Uh, cause I, Oh, and, and I just, you know, was playing with it. And I didn't think it was that easy to come out. I'm surprised more people don't get killed accidentally clutching that thing and pulling it out. But I thought, you know, with the, with the, with as much trouble as I got into for doing that, that I should, I should keep that little keepsake that I did make a jump where I should have, pulled my reserve and didn't um but you know one of the one of the benefits of being as light as i am is that even with about two-thirds of a parachute i still hit the ground relatively softly so yeah yeah well you're never gonna get me to jump out of a perfectly good airplane so that's <laughs> well, well that's that's a whole nother discussion but i <laughs> firm belief that there are no perfectly good airplanes here well if you're a paratrooper and we're i know we're going far afield you you feel much safer on the ground and and you want to get out of that airplane because it's a big target filled with a bunch of people who also want to get out of the airplane. Well, and I feel much really, yeah. yeah you, I feel much safer on the ground regardless of if it's a 737 or yeah. That's the only thing you get me on is a plane to, to Hawaii. It's the only, actually, only way you get me on a plane is to go to Hawaii. Cool. <laughs> we'll, so, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah. So let's go. Move, we're gonna move on. Um, we had there was a report out of oh man somewhere that the sunk cost inertia, as we all call it, the sunken cost fallacy, is creates a uh, reduces prosperity in government spending. So it's kind of like the more government spends, the worse they're at the worse at God I can't talk today. The worse they are at spending it, and it just kind of reduces everybody's prosperity, which we all kind of instinct instinctively know. If the government well, is all yeah, the money out of my it, pocket, I don't have as much money. It's a simple concept if you think about it. If a government, or if a, if a, if a business uh, spends money foolishly and ends up uh, losing money, they quit spending it. And if they don't quit spending it, they go out of business. They go bankrupt. And then they absolutely quit spending anything. In government, the absolute opposite occurs. If the government is spending money on something and it doesn't work, the excuse is, well, we don't have, we haven't spent enough. We need to spend more. And so they spend more and more, and it's just more and more money goes down the rat hole until it, it, it creates a bureaucracy that is so huge and so entrenched and so impossible to remove that the program, which doesn't work, stays there forever, literally. And that's why we have uh, things like Medicare. That's why we have Social Security. That's why we have uh, the War on Poverty. All of those programs, the War on Drugs, all of those programs have been proven uncut. Uh, incontrovertibly that they don't work. Poverty has not been alleviated. It's, it's greater than when uh, LBJ started the war on poverty. Healthcare costs more than when Medicare and Medicaid were started. Uh, Social Security, we're no more secure in our retirement now, probably less secure than we were before uh, FDR and the New Deal. All of those programs have been proved without any question whatsoever, if you want to look at it rationally. They don't work. The, the answer by government, well, we need to spend more money. That's uh, one of the problems. The second problem is, is that the more money the government spends, the less money that's left uh, available for the private sector to spend. So you've got more money being spent on, on, uh, on non-productive endeavors, feeding the bureaucracy, and less money being spent on entrepreneurial productive endeavors, uh, making and creating things. And I, I'm going to add something to that. I actually agree with Richard. Let me write that down. Um, that 
there's a there's multiplier effects to how money is spent and economists look at i mean real economists not the economists that are running you know most of the colleges and university the economics department there are multiplier effects some uh, types of businesses have very high multipliers for a dollar spent like for some reason and, and i think we could probably drill down and figure it out ourselves but manufacturing has a very high multiplier. If a, if, if, if a manufacturing, if a factory uh, is created in a town somewhere, it, it, the, the money invested in that factory has a high multiplier. It will actually create uh, that $1 investment in that factory will create, uh, I think, somewhere between $3 and $5. Whereas the multiplier effect of, of um Government spending, if you listen to government economists, they'll say it's like two to one. But what they forget is something that Richard talked about, is that you're not letting the market make a decision about where the capital is supposed to be sent because the market makes intelligent choices. You're making some, uh, you're letting some idiot who the only job they could get was in government make a decision about how to spend money that somebody actually worked to create. So it's an inefficient allocation of resources. And then once, as Richard pointed out, once the, the person, uh, the, the, the government-run program proves to, to be inefficient and corrupt and not accomplish its mission, instead of just shutting it down, which you would do a bad business, you just throw more, more good money after bad and take more money out of the economy that the capitalists would spend wisely. So it's an ever-increasing spiral of stupid. And I think we might have beat this one to death. Uh, well, yeah, but I mean, you said a two-to-one uh, return on investment for public spending. It's actually less than one. You spend, yeah. you, you no, get I, more less back than you spend on, on most on government uh, spending programs taken as a whole. So it's yeah, it's a it's a losing yeah, game at this point. That's well, a point it, it ends up creating. Oh, sorry, John, go ahead. No, government economists say that it's two to one or one and a half to one. But anybody that doesn't work in government looks at it, says, as Richard so kindly pointed out that it's a negative multiplier. You spend a buck and you get 70 cents and it's probably less than that when you look at the, nobody talks about the opportunity of costs of what that money could be doing somewhere else. And it could be intelligently spent by people who know how to spend and invest and that doesn't happen. So that multiplier that they quote is even lower than that one to one. Yeah. Yeah, well, and it creates these various industrial complexes, the military industrial complex in a, in places like Seattle, they have a homeless industrial complex where they spend hundreds of millions of dollars and almost none of it gets to actually the homeless person. Well, it all gets to the too. And but yeah, we're getting, getting there. We're, we're, we're getting there. It's, yeah, and don't forget health care and higher education, which higher are, are education, turning into, industrial turning into uh, money sucks. Or, yeah, or in here in California, the high-speed rail. And let's talk about money sucks and high-speed rail. Our governor is running around playing Santa Claus, tossing... Uh, Money at the voters while he's while his party is sitting there changing the rules of the game of how the recalls are normally run. Oh, <laughs> fancy that. They're working on it on both ends here. They're, they're, make, they're changing the rules of the recall while they're also out there throwing money at voters saying, yeah, I'm Santa Claus. Literally, it was kind of gross the other day. He went on. He was like, yeah, I'm like Oprah. Here's free money for everybody. It was actually gross. <clears throat> How is this different than than normal? This is it's just it's 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 different because it's uh, a little bit more obvious and a little bit more uh, open and uh, uh, notorious than it normally is. Mm -hmm. Not, but unfortunately, it, it it when you're throwing free money at people, that tends to work. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, free money is obviously well, not, free. not free. Not free. Not free because you pay. Like you, know, you put it. You paid it in. You're getting uh, parts of it, part of it back, and saying, "Well, thank you very much for the alms." Yeah, thanks for giving me my money back. And well, I think you're you're right, Richard. And oh, that's twice I've agreed with you on one show. It's just historic. We should write it down. Um, there, people in in government and um, in politics now are getting more brazen. They're, they're, they're just, they've gone beyond the point of trying to appear to be moral or rational and have suddenly, the, the curtain is open, there's no wizard there. It, what's happening is 
corrupt lever A is lifted while corrupt lever B is lowered while graph lever C, and they don't care anymore. They don't care that we can see all these machinations, machinations, machinations going on. It's just like the the public has been has been so uh, beat down by watching this craziness for years. They just accept it and go, oh yeah. I was talking to somebody before the election about um, the the uh, Kamala the the candidate, uh, and this I th I thought this was a, a moral person I was talking to, and the fact that she was withheld uh, evidence in, in two capital crimes, which is essentially condemning somebody to murder by lying. Um, and the person said, oh, DAs do that. And I thought, why are we accepting this stuff? Why, why do we accept this level of, of corruption and immorality from, from uh, politicians? We wouldn't accept it from anybody else. All right, I'm going on a rant. I'm done. Yeah, yeah well, we couldn't get away with that. We couldn't get away with it. Oh, well, you just... Ah, that plumber, he just does that. He just sells used equipment is new. It's fine. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Well, it's the, yeah, the most notorious example is the FBI. If you lie to the FBI, it's a federal, it's a felony. If the FBI lies to you, it's just the way they do business. Yeah, yeah it's good police work. If yeah. they're lying to you, it's good police work. But if you respond to their lie with a lie, you're a criminal. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of, it's the most absurd it's kind of the most absurd, absurd situation we've created or we've allowed to be created. It's really, we've kind of allowed it. Hmm. And in some sense, we've asked for it. We're going to move on here to about a story about police abuse. This 16 year old was what, 16, 18 year old was tased for smoke for vaping. But of course, my thing is you asked for the anti vaping laws. What did you expect was going to happen? You create all these petty laws and you ask police to enforce them. What do you expect is going to happen? Well, not only that, but I, I would say that probably there is an expectation that uh, violence is going to happen, and that will be an expectation or a, uh, a way for the conservative element in politics to say, hey, we need more police. Look at all of these scoff laws. And the best example of that is uh, right now uh, menthol cigarettes are being uh, made illegal. Guess who smokes the most menthol cigarettes? It's not white guys like us. It's the black community. Now, I'm not in favor of smoking uh, cigarettes, menthol or otherwise, but if you make them illegal, guess who is going to be subject to more police brutality for selling or for using, and I use that word deliberately, using, uh, as in narcotic using, uh, menthol cigarettes. It's going to be the black community, which is going to uh, make police abuse of the black community even worse than it already is. It used to be, you know, if you get if you sell uh, a Lucy uh, on the street, you get you get strangled by the cops. Now, if you inhale a, a, a Newport, you, same thing. It's, same. it's you know, it's or a, yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a circle. It's a spiral of despair that we're uh, creating by making more and more and more things illegal, and then uh, asking cops to enforce unenforceable laws. I could have a question about the whole vaping thing. I'm, I'm going on my two minute vaping rant again. Why, why uh, is in this country, are we trying to prevent people from vaping so that they inhale burning cigarette smoke, which is what causes all the cancers and the emphysema and everything. When in England, bless their little looking at numbers hearts, they celebrate the fact that 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 a whole lot fewer of their uh, populace is smoking real cigarettes and they're vaping, and they celebrate it because all the rational data that they look at indicated that vaping is pretty near harmless compared to smoking cigarettes. Smoking cigarettes kill how many people in this country? But oh, but, but, but vaping, vaping is a gateway drug, just like marijuana yeah. is a gateway to heroin. It's yeah. all based on, on fear tactics, which are 100% which are, are BS. Mm. So would you rather have somebody have, have the 16-year-old the smoking a cigarette or a 16-year-old vaping? Obviously. Neither. We can prevent them to do that by having cops knee them in the back. Yeah, because prohibition has always worked, right? Yeah, prohibition works every single time it's tried. Well, no, yeah, it hasn't worked, but we just haven't spent enough money on it. Yeah. We well, haven't I, spent enough I, money. I, we haven't passed enough laws. We haven't we haven't killed enough people yet, so clearly they don't think we're taking it seriously. You know, kill all the drug dealer, drug users, and you've, the problem's solved. 
I, yeah. I, I just want them to have a prohibition on hair because then, you know, I'll just hey, hey, you would look normal. Yeah. yeah. Hey, 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 wait mean? a minute. I look, I look relatively I normal. Feel I, mean, I feel attacked. Yeah. I feel attacked there, though, John. Yeah. I feel attacked. <laughs> Well, if they de declared a prohibition on hair, yours would grow. It would be like four feet long before you know it. Anytime, well, this... anytime the, the United States government declares a, a war on anything, as Richard so correctly pointed out again, that's three times in one show. <laughs> uh, it increases. War on poverty. Poverty has gone up. War on crime. Crime goes. Well, there, there were some periods where draconian policing actually uh, reduced crime. That We talk about our dearly beloved senile president now with his uh, um, being the cheerleader for some draconian laws that throw a whole bunch of people in prison. You know, just if you, if you, if you take enough people and throw them in prison that for a while, it, it takes a while to grow criminals. Of course, crime's going to go down for a while, but then the unintended consequence of having all those people in prison, not being, useful citizens and having all those people involved and warehousing them and building the prisons. Oh, now I'm getting it. Anyway, so uh, it's uh, government at its finest. Declare war on it and it shall grow. Declare war on this, uh, on, on, no, that, that's, a, that, that doesn't work. Never mind. Let's, let's move on. Well, they've made marijuana legal. They have to replace it with something. They have to make something else illegal to replace the, the you know. To the yeah, you have to justify the prison, the prison union salaries, and the, you have to justify mm -hmm. uh, the cops, uh, you know, keeping a full employment bill. I mean, drug and uh, vaping uh, laws are nothing more than a full employment bill for cops and prison guards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we want to talk about craziness. Um, there's a North Korean defector, this young woman who I actually been following her on YouTube for a little while myself, but she finally made she hit Fox News and she would she joined Columbia and she said this stuff is crazy, even from a North Korean perspective, kind of the wokeness on on campus. Now, if you're having someone who grew up in North Korea telling you that the stuff that's going on campus at Columbia University, the wokeness is going on at Columbia University is crazier than the stuff that happens in North Korea, you know, maybe we should. You don't have to necessarily listen to everything you say, she says, but maybe we should actually take a look at it. <laughs> you know, to have an honest look at, hey, maybe we should take an honest look at what's actually going on in these places. Oh, and I and I think the, the quote was very interesting. Um, the, the young lady was talking about how um, she was reading Jane Austen and how much she was really enjoying it. And they didn't identify the university employee the university employee said that, uh, well, you, the, you're being brainwashed by the colonialism in this book. So a university employee at, was this Columbia? Yeah. At, at one of the bastions of uh, uh, entitlement in the Western world is talking to someone who grew up in North Korea where they have no internet, the TV is state controlled, uh, the, the books were all written by the government, Newspapers are all controlled by the government and telling her that she is being subconsciously brainwashed by a book written 300 years ago as it as it teaches her to accept colonialism. So I think that in a nutshell lets you know how far quasi has gone in this country as far as wokeness goes. Well, obviously, libertarians are not apologists for colonialism or any other kind of government uh, maltreatment of, of uh, citizens, either at home or abroad. But colonialism, bad as it was in many cases, doesn't, it, it pales in comparison to the evil of the North Korean communist regime. Hmm. Yes, it does. And I would say that uh, woke, that, that getting rid of one of the things that our founding fathers in their infinite wisdom back in the dark ages came up with uh, the, the first amendment having the thought police is in its, in its way, even worse than the horrors of North Korea and colonialism because control of the mind uh, leads to the kind of atrocities and thinking that we saw Mao killing off 60 million and, 
Stalin killing off six million just in the Ukraine and, and Hitler killing off how many millions in Europe. So once the thought police are involved, horror follows. And, and that's, that's what I'm worried about. Well, luckily, I think it's starting to change. We're seeing, uh, we're starting to see more and more people starting to fight back against this kind of wokeness, whether it's, you know, the local school boards is actually, I think, where you're starting to see the biggest, at least most emotional arguments against it. But some of us have been arguing these points for a long time, long before they became right-wing talking points, as as now that the the pushers of wokeness are saying, oh, well, they're just, the complaints are just right-wing, they're just Republican right-wing talking points. Well, no, you have a serious logical problem when you're telling me that I, you're not allowed to focus on race, you're not allowed to judge people by race, but in order to do that, we have to judge everybody by race and judge everybody by these arbitrary social constructs, but we're all against arbitrary social constructs. They have no intellectual consistency, but of course they're not ever confronted on it. No one ever has to confront them on their intellectual consistency because, Wait, you know. Hold on, you, you want people to be intellectually consistent? Well, to a point, yeah. No, that's you're you've been you've been brainwashed by colonial thought. That's uh, intellectual consistency is is a, a white man's rule, which has held us all under his thumb well, for too many years. Well, I'm sorry, the Egyptians built the pillar and pyramids with some intellectual consistency. You know, you can't build those things and have them stand up with having some intellectual consistency. So <laughs> I'm not thinking that this nature of ah. All this stuff started with colonialism. Uh, no, it didn't. You know, they invented the zero a number of times. Math has been the same for 50,000 years. There's These things don't change just because white people did it during the colonial times. You can discuss the fetters of the moral fetters of colonialism without being stuck living in that world. You know, we've moved on to colonial law. Well, Actually, we're just talking about the war powers, the, the restriction of war. Say, so, oh, we move on past colonialism. Well, maybe. Not so, not so, not so much when it comes to the Middle East, no. <laughs> yeah, not so much. Maybe not so far as we want to think. I think maybe that's the question. All right, guys, we got got a minute. You guys got any closing thoughts? Well, the, the, yeah, the closing thought is, is the whole idea that now that we've legalized pot in the state of California uh, and – put in regulations that are so onerous that nobody can actually make enough money uh, growing pot legally so that the black market is actually doing a better job of marketing pot than the uh, the legal industry. Now we have a 100,000, I think it is, $100,000. dollars million. $100 million dollar bill out of the marijuana. A million industry. dollar bill, sorry. I, I keep underestimating the bureaucrats. A million dollar bill to subsidize getting around all of the rules and regulations on legally growing marijuana. We have moved from illegality to subsidization in a matter of years. Welcome, yeah. welcome to Kafka Ornia. We never think of, hey, reducing the freaking Byzantine rules that they have to deal with. No, 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 we'll just give them some money to navigate the rules. That'll solve the problem. Well, and, and, and did you notice this $100 million comes, of course, with strings. They will have to hire and train people <laughs> and create a bureaucracy to help people deal with the rules. Which will never go away. Never go away. To help people deal with the rules that the bureaucracy created.